All right, so welcome everybody to this conversation. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, here in person. And for those of you joining online, uh, welcome to uh, this event. Uh, I'm Jared Green. I'm with the Democracy Collaborative here, and this event is being put together by folks with the Next System Project. I'm a senior research associate with the Democracy Collaborative's research team. Sitting next to me is Laurie McFarland, who is visiting from uh, the UK. Who, Laurie, feel free to introduce yourself so I don't mess up the entire uh, introduction there. Yeah, uh, so yeah, my name is Laurie McFarland. I'm economics editor at uh, Open Democracy, and I'm also associate fellow at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose in London. Great, and, and Peter Gowan is also with us. Peter, uh, <laughs> uh, so we each, the three of us have uh, varying levels of expertise in, on the topics of land and housing. Uh, this is a discussion that is happening among our staff here at the Collaborative uh, to sort of help our thinking about what are the solutions to some of today's most pressing problems and issues around land and housing. Uh, you'll see a presentation from the three of us uh, going from sort of a global perspective to a micro level perspective. Um, and then we will open it up to discussion. So uh, bear with us as this is one of our first sort of experiences in this way, but um, we're happy to have all of you join us, sort of engage a little bit and see our presentations and then we'll open up for discussion and then look forward to comment and questions. Thank you. So without further ado, uh, Laurie will kick us off. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and thanks very much uh, to Joe and others for, for inviting me here. It's uh, really a great pleasure and honor to be able to, to drop by the Drop Democracy Collaborative, uh, which I think has been doing you know, amazing work on a whole bunch of issues. So it really is a, a, really, a really great honor to be here. I'm gonna give a, a quick overview on some thoughts on, on, uh, on land and housing, really drawing on a book that I was one of the co-authors of, which came out last year, uh, called Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. Um, shortly after the book came out, uh, the, the Financial Times uh, did a review of the book, uh, and the, the opening line of the review said, Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing is an appealing book, but it's not an appealing title. And they said, uh, it would sell many more copies if instead we'd called it, This is Why You Can't Afford to Buy a House. Uh, at which point we kind of thought that would be a much better title, um, but we're stuck with this kind of rather cumbersome technocratic name, um, so maybe for the second edition, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm just going to give so, some thoughts really uh, on some of the key issues that I think are, are at the root of the whole issue of land and housing that we ought to be thinking about. I'm not going to go into too many details on, on, on solutions or anything like that, I think we can maybe tease that out in the discussion. Um, so if you forgive me for, for being kind of quite high level and quite quick, hopefully I'm, I want to leave as much time as possible for, for discussion. Um, I just wanted to, to start off, though, by just showing this quote, which I actually just came across the other day. Um, uh, it's by Savills, which is a, a UK-based uh, but globally uh, relevant estate agent. Uh, and they had a really interesting report recently looking at trying to estimate the value of real estate in the world. Uh, and it's quite telling. They say, we estimate that the value of all uh, developed real estate in the world amounts to approximately $217 trillion dollars. Real estate is the preeminent asset class comprising nearly 60% of all total assets in the world. Um, and I think this is really telling because it tells us straight away that real estate 
uh, the, the majority of that is residential, so housing, but some of it's obviously commercial as well, uh, is the most valuable asset uh, in our economy, in our, in our global economy. And this highlights for me the, the real tension, uh, which is at the root of many of the issues when it comes to land and housing, which is that land and housing plays two roles in our economy, uh, two roles that are in conflict with each other and in tension with one another. On the one hand, we, we all need land and housing to exist. We all need it to live, we all need it to work, we all need it to play. And ideally we want access to space to exist at an affordable level. We want to make sure that our rent or our mortgage or indeed our office space is affordable so that we can all meet uh, our potential, we can all meet our needs. On the other hand though, um, as we've just seen, land and housing is uh, the prime investment class of asset. It is a prime vehicle for accumulating wealth uh, around the world. And from that perspective, uh, what they want from land and housing is something different. They want returns, financial returns, which means prices going up and rents going up. And so we have a real conflict between these two different roles of land and housing. And where it's tricky is that on the latter perspective, this perspective, it's not just the global financial elite uh, who, are, who have an interest in this perspective. For the large part, it's actually a lot of ordinary middle-class citizens uh, in places like the US and places like the UK who own their own home. Uh, in the UK, home ownership is about 60%, so the majority of the population. Uh, and for them, their, their home is their prime asset. It's a prime source of wealth. It's a prime source of asset wealth that makes up the bulk of their net wealth. Uh, and therefore, they, 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 depend, they, they, they depend on that asset wealth being maintained or, or increased. Um, this chart here, I think, is uh, quite a good illustration of this. It shows household net wealth in the UK uh, since 1995. And it shows the composition of that broken down between land, dwellings, and other assets. And you can see that virtually about three quarters of the increase in wealth over the last 20 years has been accumulated basically by property through land and the dwellings uh, above them. Uh, wealth increased from about two and a half trillion to just under 10 trillion during that period, uh, largely through the property market. So you can see how much of a role this plays uh, in our economy. And this is kind of reflected elsewhere as well. This is just the figures. For, for the UK. But as I said before, this is very much, depending on which side of the fence you're on, uh, depending on, that, that basically has a key impact on how this has affected you. This chart here has tried to illustrate this tension in a, in a kind of simplistic way. Um, and really what we're showing here is that increasing land values, property values, has two effects on our economy. For those who own property or invest in property, uh, increases net wealth, uh, increases substantial returns, provides greater economic security, and if you're a homeowner who's built up home equity, it enables you to then borrow more, perhaps to buy more property. But for everyone else, uh, it means high rent, the rent market, having to save more for a deposit, overall leaving you worse off, less disposable, uh, less disposable income. And this really il illustrates for me a kind of fault line that is that runs through our society and is increasingly being running through our society as. Uh, property values have exploded in recent decades across advanced economies. Uh, the value of property relative to GDP has been going up uh, pretty rapidly. The question is therefore, what's been driving this? You know, what, is, what, what lies behind the fact that we've seen this, where land and property values have been skyrocketing? What are the reasons for that? The reality is it's, it's, it varies in different places. Uh, the domestic agenda has a real impact. The laws, policies, regulations, history and politics of places make, make for the fact that places have radically different uh, policy landscapes. But the key factor, there has been a common thread running through uh, some of this across uh, economies like the US and the UK. There's been changes to the, uh, to the financial sector over the past four decades. Um, before the 1970s, uh, we had reasonably, uh, reasonably strict regulation on our, on our financial sector, all of it legacy of the Wall Street crash. Through a process of deregulation and liberalization, we had a dramatic shift in the role that banks play in our economy. The kind of textbook, textbook role that banks play is that they make loans to businesses to finance investment, and that's kind of what they do. They might do a bit of mortgage lending on the side, but that's what they do. But actually, that's not really true anymore. For the most part, most banks in countries like the US and the UK uh, predominantly lend to finance the purchase of already existing property assets. 
So they basically create credit and that flows into the financing of purchase of property or real estate, uh, whether it's housing or, or commercial real estate. This chart here shows two things. The red line is mortgage credit and the dotted blue line is house prices. And this is for 17 advanced economies uh, across the world, including the US, including the UK uh, and others as well. And you can see that there's been a dramatic increase. If you look at uh, the right hand side of the chart, mortgage credit has just skyrocketed as has uh, real house prices in these countries. Um, and what's been going on is what we call, in the book, we call a, a land credit feedback cycle. Um, but effectively, to, to kind of simplify, um, the liberalization of the financial sector unleashed a flood of new credit into the real estate market. And when you have an elastic supply of credit interacting with something that is reasonably limited in supply, uh, the inevitable price is asset price inflation. Um, you then have the fact that prices go up, that means people need to take out larger mortgages to buy a property, which means household debt goes up. Um, and they have this kind of self-fulfilling cycle that's going round and round that of more mortgage lending, higher prices, more household debt. Uh, this is propped up by a whole bunch of other things, which will go into too much detail. Government policies that are, well, are propping this up. Uh, financial innovation, we had, uh, the advent of securitization allowed banks to package up loans slice them, dice them, offload them off the balance sheet, etc. Really feeding into this uh, uh, feedback cycle, of pushing up land and property prices, um, and crucially creating a link, uh, a kind of intertwinement between our land and property market and our financial sector. Whereas the reality is today, much of our financial institutions, banks, their balance sheets are secured against property values in our economy. And so if, you, if, we, if there's a tension there between on the one hand of addressing affordability issues, which means making prices come down, uh, and on the other hand, maintaining the asset wealth of existing owners and ensuring the solvency of financial institutions. So there's a real tension there between uh, 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 various different interests. And I think that relies at the, at the, at the, at the core here. What impact has had? Um, I'll just run through this very, very quickly. This is this, this, the result that we've, the place that we've landed in is obviously suboptimal for a whole range of reasons. Um, inequality, a growing divide between those who own property and those who don't, uh, those who are facing higher rents, uh, higher costs versus those who are riding the wave of increasing asset prices. A, a, a trend that's going to be exacerbated by inheritance as property gets passed on. Huge misallocation of resources. So the availability of high returns from investing in property uh, means that a lot of resources are being diverted uh, away from more socially useful or productive activities. We've got huge challenges, uh, environmental challenges, social challenges. We've got so much of our money in our society flowing into property, which is just pushing up prices. It's an incredible waste. Uh, high levels of indebtedness. Uh, as I said before, this system relies on growing burden of household debt, uh, which poses a number of reasons for or a number of challenges, uh, weighs down on demand, it also increases financial fragility, uh, which leads, of course, to the last area, which is financial instability. As we know, many of the booms and busts that we've seen uh, across the world, not just here, uh, tend to be tied up in some way, shape or form with real estate markets. Uh, and of course, we know that the people who tend to pay the price for these prices are those who can afford at least and who did, the, uh, who did very little to contribute uh, to it. And just very quickly to, to, to finish off before, uh, before we move on. Uh, I just want to fly through some policy options that are available. Uh, in terms of what to do about it, um, there's lots of different things to talk about, and there's lots of different angles that we can, that we can look at. Uh, ownership, taxation, subsidies, financial reform, planning reform, all these different areas, I think, are, are absolutely key. There's no single bullet solution to what we do about this. Um, but one thing I just want to highlight here is, I, I put here, what does a right to buy of the left look like. And just to provide a little bit of context, what that is, right to buy in Britain was a policy by Margaret Thatcher, which basically privatized one and a half million public houses into private hands. And what that did was uh, not only shifted housing provision dramatically, but it changed the kind of whole uh, ideological perspective of lots of people who suddenly got a stake in private property, got a stake in unearned wealth, and that was a, a, that was a real uh, intentional decision of the Conservative Party to do that. And it changed the political economy of Britain for decades. And I think when we think about how do we address this, how do we shift the issue of land and housing back into a more community or collective provision? How can we do that? What's the equivalent that we can think about that just as powerful as, as, as right to buy was? Um, I think I'll leave it there. I'm, I look forward to having a, yeah, a discussion, any questions? 
Fantastic. Great. So now we'll have Peter uh, Cowan come join us. I was at the Democracy Collaborative, and I will shift roles here. Uh, just a sort of note on the format here. We're each sort of talking about, about 10 minutes of presentation or so, and then we'll have two questions. So Peter will go next, and then I'll go, and then we'll open up to the room. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll start. I'll start talking while John gets it set up. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Cowan. Uh, I am a summer resident fellow here at the Next System Project Democracy Collaborative, um, and I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, tenure models and different uh, structures that can be implemented in the rental sector, uh, specifically. Um, so, have we got this up yet? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, so, really, there are kind of two visions with people who are like progressively oriented in a lot of Anglo Saxons, uh, English speaking countries about how um, we should structure our housing markets with regards to like ordinary people, um, how we should provide housing to low income people and to middle class people. And um, the one that sort of prevailed in government policy, whether that be sort of Democratic Party administrations here or like under New Labour in the UK, is really a sort of a modified version of the neoliberal framework in which um, we take a group of people who we decide are like those most in need and we attempt to increase demand side housing benefits for them we might provide them with a small residual public or social housing sector. Uh, we rely on uh, ordinances like inclusionary <coughs> zoning to siphon off a small amount of uh, below market rate housing from private development. And all of those things are extremely necessary in the current structure of housing because there are um, there's no alternative at the moment. There's no um, large social rented sector. Um, so there's a typology that was come, came up with by a guy called Jim Kemeny in the 1990s who divides countries into two broad categories of state policy with respect to housing tenure. That's like how you are in your own property, whether that be that you're renting off the government, whether you're renting off a cooperative, whether you're renting off a private landlord or whether you're an owner occupier and then within owner occupiers, whether you own outright or whether you're a mortgage holder. Um, and with respect to housing tenure in the private rental sector, specifically, there are what he calls dualist and unitary models. So the dualist model um, involves very strong state support for home ownership. Um, that means like favorable tax treatment, things like the mortgage interest reduction here, um, things like uh, right to buy in the United Kingdom, um, subsidies for first time buyers, um, all of the sort of range of supports that people um, who are like on the cusp of being able to become homeowners require in order to actually get themselves into home ownership. So those are all very strongly provided in dualist models, which are common in um, Ireland, the United Kingdom since Thatcherism, um, the United States, Canada, Australia. Um, there's very little regulation on private landlords. So there's few, if any, rent controls, uh, eviction controls. There's little security of tenure. They're like often quite short-term leases people can be uh, moved out of their houses afterwards and then social housing or affordable housing in, in air quotes because affo affordable housing is one of these sort of slippery terms it can either mean housing that is affordable um which is what it means to most people or to people in the housing sector it can also mean a different thing which is some government defined term called affordable housing which either means below a certain level or that some like discount off market rates um Anyway, so social housing or affordable housing is highly controlled. It's only for the very lowest income percentiles. There's often very long waiting lists for it. It's often a residual sector that's shrinking over time with respect to the size of the population. Um, in some countries, there was a growing social housing sector in the past. Certainly in the United Kingdom, there was before it was mostly privatized. Mostly in the United States, it didn't get that far off the ground compared to the rest of Europe with the exception of some places like New York City where um, there was quite a substantial public housing investment over time, but that's declined substantially. And usually in these sectors, that is how it's gone. 
um, the unitary model is different and like very substantially different insofar as it says that the social rented sector, that being uh, public housing, um, community owned housing, generally non-market rate housing um, is highly invested in by the government with the intention of competing directly with the private rented sector so as to be a buffer underneath um, the like the, the private sector it means that if you have access to this standard of housing in the public or social sector then private landlords can't undercut that so it acts as a de facto rent control on them it acts as a de facto de facto standards control on them, they have to beat that. Um, and the thing, the thing with this is that it also has some really, really interesting benefits to the wider market at large. So people in the private rental sector in countries like the United States, in countries like Ireland, where I'm from, in countries like the United Kingdom, if they have a family, if they are like they need stability if their kids are in a school and they're in the private rental sector they're constantly worrying about rent increases they're constantly worrying about being evicted or being displaced due to gentrification because their because their tenure is not secure at all because they, their rent is not controlled and if their area starts gentrifying if their rents start going up then they're good their kids are going to have to move schools or they're going to have to commute for hours at a time um that means that people get pushed into home ownership. And specifically, it means that people who like, a, there, it induces a huge amount of demand for home ownership. And it, it does so in a way that people are feeling quite desperate about it. They don't feel like they can delay it because it can be quite time sensitive. Um, that means people will take out bigger and bigger mortgages. It contributes to the financialization of it. And um, generally, it creates a push for more incentives for home ownership because people feel really unstable in this market. And the underinvestment and the perception of social housing in these countries means that those people don't want to move down into social housing, means they want to move up into home ownership. The unitary model looks at social housing, looks at um, like social housing broadly defined. So in some countries that means nonprofit housing, in a lot of countries that means public housing. Um, is something that's for everyone. It's something for middle class people, it's something for working class people, it's something for poor people. It's often something for upper middle class people as well. Um, sometimes there are income limits, but usually in unitary systems, if you go over that limit, you're allowed to remain in your house. It's a house for life. Um, and um, it can, and it, the, the other thing that it does is that it is a counter cyclical um, intervention in the housing market. So um, obviously the housing finance is currently dependent on a huge amount of like private financial institutions. You need to be able to like borrow from, like to borrow to buy a house um, and then like private construction companies, developers need to get their finance to build houses. If the housing market is going down, if people are not buying at the moment, then houses don't get constructed on the same scale. Um, so if you look at the chart here in Ireland, where we have a highly financialized and highly dualist housing market, you have a huge amount of construction during the property boom, and then it crashes into the ground after people stop uh, buying houses. Um, whereas if you, if you look at Austria, which is a highly unitary system, where in, I think it's like 40% of the whole country live in social housing, in Vienna that's 60%. Um, you have a very stable rate of housing construction over time. It's very predictable. People know how many houses are being built. And then when you look at housing prices over time, you might expect looking at that, that more houses were constructed in Ireland over this period, that um, if you're looking at this from the very like traditional supply and demand perspective, that house prices in Ireland would have reduced during this time, especially during this period, and may have risen again uh, once supply stopped increasing. That is not the case. Uh, house prices in Ireland increased hugely over the period of that boom. This is, and some, some people will say in response to this, oh, but you have to take into account the population. Ireland built about 150,000 more houses than households were formed over the course of this period here. Um, and then once the finance leaves, house prices start, start falling again. Whereas in Austria, you have a really, really consistent, stable um, set of, um, 
like a very stable rate of house prices uh, because it's a very controlled sector. The home, like the home ownership um, is something that people do, but it's something they do in the like if they decide that they want to. They have the backstop of social housing. If they don't want to, um, and they're not really feeling forced into it, so it minimizes the level of financialization in that sector. Um, then another thing that it does is. Um, because of the sort of counter cyclical nature of it, it means that um, the government can take up the slack with regards to the labor force. So construction labor uh, is highly skilled and the people who manage all these projects um, require work. And when a, there's a huge amount of layoffs, every time there's a recession, a huge amount of people leave that labor force and then they require to be trained again once um, the economy picks back up again, once there's more demand. and it increases the prices for those people while there's like a cons while there are um, constraints on the supply of people available. Now, um, if you look at the United States, um, this is uh, construction employment. Uh, oh wait, no, that's my computer. This is the one. So, so this is the United States. The blue line is total employment and non-farm payrolls. The red line is construction employment. And you see at the start here, this is while the United States is constructing substantial amounts of public housing. It's, it's putting a lot of capital investment into building new housing. And I'm not saying that all of this housing was very good. It was often highly segregated, low quality, but it was actually like building uh, housing directly. It filled in a counter cyclical demand. You look here, this is about 1973 when uh, Nixon and George Romney put in the moratorium on uh, a lot of new public housing projects and 1974 when Section 8 is brought in as this like large demand subsidy program that effectively replaced uh, uh, in a large way investment in new public housing projects. That, um, that process had started beforehand but really it was around 73, 74 where that really takes off. And you can see that immediately afterwards, you start getting a huge increase in the cyclicality of construction employment and presumably of construction just in general um, in the country. This is also replicated in the United Kingdom where the only times where housing construction have been over 300,000 houses a year have been times when at least a third of that was social housing. So um, when people talk about supply and demand in housing, um, really the best way of actually ensuring a strong supply of housing and a strong supply of labor to build that housing, to ensure that it's affordable for people to construct and affordable sometimes for the private sector to construct as well, because it's beneficial to them in, in, in terms of like making sure that these skills aren't lost, you don't have to pay for retraining and all of that, um, that um, you, like, you actually have these two sectors working in tandem. And I like personally, I'm in favor of the public sector increasing over time. But really, the most like the most important thing is to actually have it there and to have something there that can pick up the slack in times when there is very little private finance in that the state can step in and do it and do the work itself, whether that's building public housing or whether that's financing um, this nonprofit or community land trust housing, um, housing cooperatives or other uh, forms of housing there. So um, really, um, I think this is what uh, me and Ryan were trying to stress in the paper that we wrote is that um, what's, what's most important for this is that you have uh, this public sector involvement and also, as, as Jared will talk about, future, like, uh, talk about in his paper, that um, when we get back into this, yeah, you have these good macroeconomic effects of this, but also there were huge amounts of problems in public housing in the United States in the past. There was disgraceful segregation, um, run down blocks, and that it is also possible to do this really well. So like rich people live alongside poor people in Finland, in Vienna. Um, these are integrate. These are often integrated places, or substantially more integrated than the United States. There are problems with um, racism in European housing models, and I don't want to deny that. But it, like, it's certainly not to the same extent as it has been in the United States. We can redouble our efforts. There's often a lot of like fear about the like terms like social housing in the United States. 
polish up the images of Pruitt Ego or Cabrini Green. Um, and like there were issues with those projects. Sometimes these like these issues are uh, exaggerated to uh, like by people who are stereotyping, but there were legitimate issues. There were like a lot of legitimate issues too. Um, but that's not to say that we can't do better in the future. And it's not to say that we can't have a democratic um, community or publicly controlled housing sector um, that's racially integrated, socially just, and fit for the future. And uh, with that, I would like to pass on to Jared, who will talk more about this topic. So I'm going to uh, first start off with a disclaimer. I'm getting ready to bring us way <laughs> down to the ground. Um, I know that uh, both Peter and Laurie's topics and discussion is, is pretty up there uh, in terms of the macro uh, level scene and sort of the economy of how this all works, but sort of where we're all situated. I'm sure folks in the audience are thinking about, you know, personally their experience and what in their work as well and their exposure to, to housing issues. Um, and, and trying to figure out how that relates to what they've discussed. So I'm getting ready to bring us down to such a, a tangible level on the ground um, that I, I want to just make sure that folks are aware where the conversation is going. So what, so what uh, I'm going to share with you all, I wanted to share with a, a couple of slides that I uh, put together for an event in Arlington. So Arlington, Virginia is a place and they recently had a gathering around inclusive housing that was um, put on by the Alliance for Housing Solutions in Arlington and brought together a, a couple of folks. But the main point of the event was really to try and help uh, Arlingtonians think about uh, how their, their housing economy is working, particularly in a place right outside of Washington, D.C., where things are thriving. Um, there's limited sort of bounds on uh, space and the market is just really high up. So uh, Arlington is a really expensive place to live. They have had a historically sort of very limited amount of investment in public housing and uh, very um, affordable housing is a huge issue, but it's, it's like really concentrated to South Arlington and in many ways. And as most of the folks who migrate to DC to, for jobs and whatnot, move into Arlington, most of the, the construction of Delta has been in these sort of towering multi-family or huge condo building. So a lot of folks are sort of galvanizing around <coughs> Arlington as a place that needs to be a place for everyone. Um, and what are some of the solutions? So I put together some slides uh, to sort of give folks a general idea of sort of uh, as part of a panel on what's next. And then also try to think about uh, other dynamics in other cities where some of the strategies I'm gonna name are working that have similar sort of uh, economic, political and sort of market dynamics as Arlington. So the first thing I want to know, and then the, secondly, I just want to, I guess, uh, again, boil this down to a United States context. Um, what we have heard thus far is, is pretty broad in terms of global, and it's, it's all very true in many ways for the United States. Um, and some of the evidence was shown about what's going on in the United States. And I wanted to make sure folks know that the, the paper that we're actually releasing soon, Community Control of Housing, which is driving my discussion here today, uh, focuses around is what are folks doing around a more pressing sort of personal and even community concern around displacement and how that's happening in their communities. Um, and, and in some ways, there are universities and hospital networks, which we call here the Democracy Collaborative Anchor Institutions, that are also grappling with this question and thinking about what ways they can, what they can they do to address these, these uh, challenges. So I'll start from there. So this is what my, my slide out there, and I wanted to sort of just let all out and say, and, and also in a helpful way, perhaps for this conversation, is let folks know we're the strategies I'm going to talk about: community land trust, resident-owned communities, land banks, uh, community benefit agreements, and um, <laughs> limited equity housing cooperatives. We're talking about something that's less than one percent of all housing in the housing economy in the United States. So we're really dialing this down to a sector of housing and home ownership, and and also strategies that are used to address these issues, that's really tiny. And that's not accidental. There's a broader discussion I could have here today about the dynamics of how our housing economy, particularly in the United States, is built out to serve the American dream and 
as Peter alluded to, sort of the racialized dynamic of um, displacement, exclusion, and wealth uh, creation in this country. But I'll save that for another day in time, um, but just know that that's all there. Um, so for folks who are unfamiliar, I'll run through this really quickly. Community land trusts, which are there about 225 active community land trusts in uh, the country. Let me pull this uh, next slide up. So there are about 225 community land trusts in the country, and that's what this slide is. Um, and the point I want to make is that across socioeconomic, political, geographic, and market dynamics, there are these tools being used uh, in different communities and a lot. Uh, and I will say that at the top to say that a lot of folks uh, will not see themselves in the conversation, <laughs> particularly if you find or think that you are in a sort of uh, a, such a strong economy, like you're not living in New York or you're not living in any one of the coastal cities. Well, it's not true that some of the models I'm getting ready to discuss with you don't apply in those contexts. So really quickly, a community land trust is a nonprofit organization that stewards the land, stewards the land and housing uh, permanently across time. Um, perhaps a short two sentence definition of that would be as a, an example is that if I'm a homeowner, I wanna buy a home and I can't afford uh, market prices, what community land trust does, if it's established in a place, some of these are municipal, some of these are nonprofit based, uh, the nonprofit organization essentially helps through the subsidies it receives or investments it receives, uh, subsidizes that homeowner's purchase of that home. The homeowner still has to go and get a mortgage. Uh, the house is still assessed at a market value. But what happens is there are limit limitations and restrictions placed on the amount of equity that a homeowner will receive when they go to resell that home. Uh, and uh, they work in concert with the nonprofit organization to essentially steward that home over time and, and sort of have an agreement. And usually the split between equity is that uh, uh, the homeowner who was brought into a community land trust property gets about 25% of the equity that's earned over time. This could range anywhere between $10,000 to $60,000 in some cases. Um, and the nonprofit organization, community land trust, essentially gets that 75% of equity and helps use that equity to continue the affordability of the housing and its uh, portfolio. Uh, limited equity housing cooperatives, there's about 155,000 units across the country or so. Uh, these are mostly in New York City. Um, so folks may have heard of the Mitchell Yama co-ops, but what these are, similar to uh, community land trusts, are democratically owned housing cooperative, nonprofit organizations that are, in most cases, uh, owned by the residents who lived in a multifamily residence. So picture a multifamily building with about 84 units. Uh, and there is an, a nonprofit organization that the residents are all part of, and they own and manage and steward that building over time. They make decisions about uh, when they come together, they can figure out how much mortgage they can take on and seek out the sort of the money to sort of finance the building. Over time, they help manage the building together. They can do this with assistance from a real estate uh, company, or they can do it on their own, depending on how literate folks are in that in that capacity but essentially the community land trust and the limited equity housing cooperatives are, and then also the resident owned community is sort of a branch of the housing cooperative model uh but mostly a manufactured housing uh context which is that third um sort of strategy here these are all direct forms of communal control of ownership of how land and housing so in these three models residents living in these housing uh tenures and strategies all own or rent in some cases their properties. I'll get into the rent piece a little later because I either hit on a point around uh, the choice of homeownership. I want to talk about that a little bit later. I'll bring it up in question. Uh, the other two models I have up here, strategies I have, are land banks, which are municipal organizations that can be established by municipalities. And there are about 170 of those around the country. What they do is bring in land often in cities that have uh, surplus property or, or for, a lot of foreclosure. And delinquency what they do is help to clear title they'll take uh through they'll take property through a receivership process and they will clear title in order to get that property ready for the market in many cases uh, that's historically the use uh and more more and more there are some that are partnering with community land trusts and other organizations to make sure that that land that's being brought in to uh the city that's an asset is used to address affordable housing uh issues and then the last one is community benefit agreements which I will not lie to you and give you a number four, uh, as they have essentially been emerging over the last two decades now, because we're in 2018, which is surprising. Um, and uh, community benefit agree agreements are essentially uh, contracts established between a coalition of nonprofit organizations that come together and rally around 
uh, a set of needs that need to be addressed when a developer comes in and wants to use a lot of public subsidy to build out on some property that's in the community. And so I have examples of those uh, in the presentation. So the first thing, keeping in mind that I, I want to use models that would resonate with the community in Arlington, which is concerned with the sort of, you know, they're an expensive community, folks are moving there, they have a limited space in terms of what, you know, vacant property and vacant land, that's not something you would see here. You might see vacant land and property issues in places like Buffalo or Pittsburgh or other sort of areas around the country. But in Arlington, Virginia, they're kind of landlocked in a way and also have limited needs. So what I wanted to point out was Oakland Community Land Trust, because that's just across the water from San Francisco, another thriving, bustling metropolis. Um, and there, uh, folks there, this, Community Land Trust was established in 2009 amid uh, the Great Recession. Oakland was going through a huge uh, foreclosure crisis. I think it was something like 14,000 homes foreclosed in Oakland at the time that they uh, got set up. And so folks who were part of the sort of strong leadership community in the Community Land Trust space worked with uh, government agencies there to help get this nonprofit started up. And essentially what it is is an 18, uh, they have 18 uh, single limited and zero equity single family residential properties. They started off as single family. Um, that's important because essentially they've uh, shifted into a multifamily uh, preservation. So how can they convert existing multifamily units into a land trust? They've got a community orchard, um, which I would say speaks to the community land trust model. We've talked a lot about housing here, but particularly the community land trust model uh, and also the cooperative model can be really resourceful and helpful for communities thinking about how to preserve other types of space and, and how they can use and address other kinds of issues. And they recently just uh, acquired a mixed use community facility. And that's the picture you see in the background. These folks just bought and, and they, I should say bought, they, they raised enough money to essentially uh, support their ability to purchase and convert a property that they've been using um, and, and led by one of the tenants sort of um, some relation, a personal relationship, they were able to raise enough money to buy that property and uh, Cambridge Open Community Land Trust. Um, so just a quick couple of notes on uh, Open Community Land Trust. Again, they were established in 2009 in the of the recession. They received a significant amount from the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, which the federal government put into pro uh, process around the foreclosure crisis. And then um, one thing I wanted to elevate is just sort of the shift from single family to multifamily homes, which there are a lot of folks living in multifamily properties who are renting. Um, and like in DC, where there are a lot of renters in single family and multifamily houses, um, it can be kind of hard to figure out how to keep people from being displaced. Well, this land trust is using that, acknowledging that problem and then using the strategy of the land trust to try and keep folks in place and convert that property to something that they own together or maybe renters of uh, together. <clears throat> the next one I wanted to highlight was a, a cooperative. So this is the Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association. They, got that saying that, there we go. Uh, it are uh, sort of a collective of 22 cooperatively owned multifamily mixed use buildings in New York City in the Cooper Square community, which is on the Lower East Side of the city. Um, there are about 328 affordable housing units, 24 storefronts, and 290 shareholders, if you can believe it. Um, and they were created in 1991 um, as the result of perhaps maybe two decades of advocacy prior uh, during the renewal, urban renewal process of the Cooper Square Committee. So that group was a community-based community or organization that sort of stewarded the interests of that community, uh, particularly fearful of displacement uh, once urban renewal plans started to sort of hit the ground there. And as many folks probably in the room know and, and are familiar with urban renewal, probably not too popular among folks who, I guess the have-nots of the world, uh, where folks who, uh, you know, were at risk of displacement, low income or poor, sort of had their communities completely blighted and, and run down by government's investment in major cultural centers, academic centers, and so many other sort of large institutions. And so Cooper Square is a community that said, we don't want to have this in our community. We don't want your major investment to come and sort of rip us out of our homes. And they sort of took a, what I would call in our report, a political state um, in, in some of the properties in their community to make sure that they were in a, uh, evicted or displaced from all of that process. And it was really successful. Um, in 1991, they established this uh, cooperative sort of association to help uh, keep themselves in their homes and help all the owners sort of own uh, their properties. And in 1994, they then converted and added sort of a, a 
Green Land Trust uh, organization as part of that to make sure that when residents sort of transition out of their cooperative housing, they don't sort of sell it back to the market um, and not have a means to keep that housing afford uh, affordable for the next generation of folks. And then uh, I guess one I wanted to highlight was recently, this organization was uh, awarded some funds from the New York State capacity, CLT capacity building funds. New York State recently settled a um, lawsuit with a couple of major banks and they put into a pot of money, uh, a pot of funds, some money for Community Land Trust to help resource and build out Community Land Trust because that's a pressing issue. And then uh, what I wanted to do given time was just really quickly go through support and uh, how these things can come about and particularly in financing. Um, again, I put this great presentation together for uh, folks in uh, Arlington who were thinking about how, how can we get this done in Arlington and like many other communities has an affordable housing trust fund, which is how they resource all of their money. And in Arlington, they don't actually have a public housing agency. What they do is they give the money to the affordable housing impact fund, I believe is what it's called. And then a lot of that money goes out to essentially what's like a section eight voucher program that sort of subsidizes the affordable housing in those communities. Um, so I, obviously I put that affordable house trust fund prior, uh, prioritization at the top. Um, they're about, there are different metrics that are used in affordable housing trust funds to essentially award money from that's collected from real estate transactions and other transactions that fund that fund, that finance that fund. And then uh, those funds get to sort of award that money to different recipients so that they can be uh, allocated and help support affordable housing needs. Uh, two of the ones I wanted to point out, well, one of which is right here in Washington, D.C., there's a affordable housing trust fund that supports residents who uh, exercise their TOPA rights, their Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act rights, which is a law that was passed in the 1980s um, and has essentially given tenants in the Washington, D.C. area uh, the right to, the first right of refusal to purchase their property uh, if their landlord is going to sell. So that has financed something like 1,400 properties uh in the last you're getting old here folks about three decades or so <laughs> um and so uh recently there's been a little controversy they actually limited the law from being applied to all properties that used to be applied to any kind of housing where there's a lot of rental folks are and in dc there's a vibrant rental community where folks will rent out single family homes and rent out each room as an individual while well, recently they actually limited the council limited the law ex to exclude single family homes. Um, but still, the law is there for multi-family properties um, and the folks who are at risk of displacement get to, uh, you know, can act, act, exercise this right. And there's a couple of different sort of steps they have to take, including raising about 5% of the asking price and there's resources like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to help support their effort to do that. And then in Vermont, they require all trust fund dollars to be spent on permanent affordable housing. And then Chicago also explicitly links their fund to CLT development. The other sort of things I've seen that are really interesting is a growing interest in and in financing affordable housing development through municipal bonding, uh, which Oakland recently, Oakland voters recently approved by ballot in 2016, and then Austin, Texas is sort of planning for a similar measure. Community benefit agreements with private developers. So the one of the most well-known ones is the one in West Harlem, uh, Columbia University and the West Harlem Development Corporation. They struck a community, develop, uh, community benefit agreement uh, that is just negotiate $150 million for, for the CBA, 20 million of which goes to affordable housing, 4 million for affordable housing legal assistance. And then Detroit voters in 2016 also adopted a community ordinance, similar to that, which essentially mandates that any project receiving a set threshold amount of public subsidy has to strike up a community benefit agreement with community folks so that community folks can not only have some democratic control and participation in the planning processes, but also will receive funding. And this is important because in so many places you'll see private development just get public subsidy with no with no need-based or requirement-based uh, investments made. And then lastly, but not least, some jurisdictions are leveraging bank settlements. I mentioned the New York State uh, settlement for the Oakland or for the uh, Cooper Square um, Association, and that was about 3.5 million and bank settlements to support uh, capacity building for community interests. So this was essentially just a, a packaging up of some of the different financing options that folks are leaning toward. And you see it's a mix between things that were approved by voters at the ballot, uh, as well as things that some agencies can sort of do on their own, uh, such as affordable housing agencies or housing agencies can start thinking about how they use the affordable housing trust funds and how they sort of award those funds. Um, and then things that uh, 
cities can do or states can do to sort of put the money that they receive. So that's a sort of quick rundown, if you will, of uh, community control of land and housing covering a couple of different strategies. There are certainly other strategies out there not covered in the forthcoming report, community control of land and housing to be out in August. Um, and also um, there's much more to discuss here. So with that, I will have my fellow panelists join me and then we will open it up for discussion. And I will say, based on all the things you've heard, you're welcome to ask us a variety of questions. I think we all carry a mix of expertise that was both presented here today and, and was not. Um, so yeah. Anyone want to strike out with the first question? And then I guess I'll ask John, who's our communications director in the room, for those who are watching online, is there a way to uh, participate online? Yeah, there's a chat in the uh, YouTube uh, page where it's streaming, where you can ask a question, and I'm looking at that. If no one has the first question, I will certainly jump in with questions. Hi there, this is a... Dave Zuckerman from the Democracy Collaborative. I really appreciated the presentations and thought that the different material you touched on helped paint a really powerful picture of both the challenges as well as potential solutions. And what struck me um, in particular was the conversation around the role of credit in kind of creating this bubble. And it almost seems like there's just a lack of productive investments for other money to go into. So it's going into one of these real asset classes and therefore distorting the markets. And so um, I want to see if you could further expand on that challenge as if, if, if that challenge is not six, if successfully um, managed or redirected, do these other solutions effectively address the core issue or create the social housing needed to ensure that people have safe and affordable housing. And, um, and then as a tack, to tack on to that, with regard to the sheer um, scope of the problem, the, the, has any of your data or research, at least within the US context, uh, led to an answer regarding the amount of capital or redirection of resources that would be needed to scale some of these um, interventions uh, across either either the highest need cities or the, the country as a whole. Thank you. The first question was a credit question around uh, sort of the dynamic of credit in you know, how that's operated in the land and housing space and whether or not sort of alternative, I, I hesitate to call them alternative because if we're going to try to mainstream them, they can't keep calling them alternative, but if they're, how do we sort of do some of these social housing or control in housing, does that help address some of the credit issue or barriers issues that are at play? If we don't address the credit and housing, do these, if we don't successfully address this issue of credit and how it's distorting what is a, a real asset and, 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 and its role in society, can, can these other solutions actually solve the problem on its own? It seems to me that this is a major distortion of the role of housing in both the marketplace because capital is coming in uh, because it's simply not finding other places for productive use and so this is a real asset that it can latch on to and, and and therefore distorts the market um i'm sure that Larry has other things to say about this so i'll defer to him afterwards but um as I don't like, I don't necessarily think that borrowing for producing housing is necessarily a bad thing. But I think that the house, like the structure that we have for borrowing to produce housing, currently only sort of pushes up the amount of um, asset generation, home ownership um, that pushes up land prices, it, um, makes housing less affordable for the people who can't afford to get onto that ladder. Um, and uh, really what I think that we need to see with credit in housing is the extension of um, public financing options, whether that be through like um, the creation of public banks or whether that be the government um, 
extending further borrowing powers to local authorities um, to produce social housing or to help um, community land trusts or other uh, community control groups that produce uh, nonprofit housing um, or limited equity housing. Um, and I think um, really we need to look at credit as a functional thing that should serve the social needs that we want to see in the housing market and that should be a more socially oriented housing sector. Um, there, like, and at the moment, credit is being marshaled to do the exact opposite of that. I do think that does need to be addressed, but I don't think that it's a matter of like, we need to get credit out of housing entirely, but rather we need to reorient its purpose. Yeah, just, just add to that, I think it's important to distinguish uh, when we're talking about housing between new development mm -hmm. and the second-hand market mm -hmm. of already existing uh, property. And the, the property market is, is, is slightly strange compared to other goods and services because most goods and services, the kind of benchmark price is the, is the new, is the brand new product. Uh, and the second-hand market, <coughs> when we're talking about property, most transactions take place in the second-hand yeah. market. That's where all the action is. And that, what happens in the second-hand market therefore determines actually a lot of the price of development because developers build houses based on what, they, what price they expect to sell it at. And so what I was talking about credit uh, uh, is, is talking about the already existing second-hand market. And what we've had is lots of money flowing into or assets already exist, and therefore that's where they, they, a lot of the inflation is happening. I think the question about development uh, is, is slightly slightly separate. I, again, I think where where new housing is being built and there's a need for it in places, it's not a frenzy bubble like we have in Ireland. I think that's uh, you know that that's absolutely fine. Um, but we have to recognise as well that we are where we are now. So if we could rewind the clock and start again, you would do things differently. But we are where we are now, um, and I think the challenge, what makes it difficult, is not necessarily uh, what what do we do. You know, I think we know what, we know what this lots of great solutions are. We've just heard a lot of them. Challenge is A, how do you scale them up? Because we already heard that they're very peripheral at the moment. Uh, that's just not the case. This isn't rolling out across the country. So how do we scale it up? But also how do we address this in a way uh, to make housing affordable permanently for people to meet need that doesn't destabilize the economy significantly in a way which causes financial instability or in a way as well, which is if you have a dramatic fall in prices from some policy intervention, uh, that effect that reduces the wealth of ordinary Americans across the country who's, who 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 feel like they you know they're entitled to that wealth. So the question is, how do you what do you do in in such a way that, that can do this without causing mass disruption or big winners and losers overnight? Uh, and on the question about about credit. Uh, I think that we, we can absolutely do move ahead with these uh, with, with, with other solutions. Um, uh, and, and what they're effectively doing is stopping any future, uh, by taking our assets into community ownership, so stopping any further future kind of um, speculation or, or, or financialization happening. Granted, there's already quite a bit that's happened, which has got to where we are just now. But I don't think we, that means we can't move ahead with some of these solutions um, without, without tackling the bigger stuff. I think, I think we can, and it stops future, uh, it, it helps sustain that community in the future. I mean, I would just add to that, that we are, even the strategies I named, operate in a capitalistic sort of space. So, you know, they're already part of the system. It's just a matter of allocating resources in an equitable manner to acknowledge some things. We, we were talking about this a little bit, we, we, a little plug for the NSP podcast. We recorded uh, some new audio for the NSP podcast that will come out when it comes out soon. Um, but, um, you know, we were just talking about uh, sort of the social contract around capitalism. Like these strategies that I named as solutions are all operating in the same credit economies that are the other sort of housing economies are. And it's really a matter of policy and public discussion to come to an agreement around how much we would invest in these things. So, uh, you know, I can make a business case for investing in community land trusts or housing cooperatives to specifically target uh, certain segments of our economy. Um, however, I think we were talking about this earlier, a lot of discussion in terms of addressing housing, which uh, housing affordability is like the prevalent issue that the balance of the United States conversation happens around. Uh, don't necessarily talk about ownership in ways other than single family home and sort of our current schema for housing. So 
um, a little bit of an abstract response to your question, but the reality is community land trusts, housing cooperatives, residential communities, they're all getting credit from similar organizations, and if not, uh, you know, community-based organizations. And those are getting credit from someplace too. So what we would really need to do is come up with ways to have a persuasive business case and, and public discourse around investing in these models. Can I just add something very, very quickly? Um, just on the, on the bigger point, at the start of my presentation, I said that there's a conflict between basically the two roles that land and housing play in our economy. One which is about serving needs, serving community needs, and the other one is about vehicles for accumulating wealth. I do think, though, that we have to be very upfront about the fact that if we are going to scale up and really uh, transform our land and housing economy so that they are much more about meeting community needs and community control rather than vehicles for accumulating wealth, the whole notion of real estate as a sector there's wealth that people make money out of, that, that, needs to, that will need to go. They're not compatible with each other. And I think sometimes we, we could have missed that when, uh, and as long as we continue to say, oh, we can have community land trust, but actually this stuff can continue over there, we'll never get the scale that we need. So there is a, there is a conflict there, and we can't pretend that there isn't, if you know what I mean. Yes. yes. I think it's important to sort of understand that you're play, like, it's playing this role in the market right now, and that it, it, it does need a business case in order to get off the ground, but that we are ultimately looking to transition away from the idea of financial assets and that the policies that we implement should be oriented towards decreasing that as much as possible over time and moving housing to be less of a commodified asset that primarily exists to generate wealth either for uh, developers, landlords, or uh, single family homeowners. Hi, uh, Dana Brown at the Next System Project. So um, you guys started to hint at the answer, I think, to, to the question I'm about to ask, but just to put a little finer of a point on it, um, if we're going to go the route of, as Lori points out, of meeting human needs, right, if we're going to take that perspective and, and try to figure out what a future state would look like in which, you know, land and, and housing policy served the needs of the masses and that we secured long-term affordability and kind of sustainability in the sector, um, whether it's, you know, no matter which of the strategies we take to get there, what does a financial system look like that supports that? Right, that what is a financial system that instead of supporting speculation and the accumulation of assets by a few, you know, in, um, in, in the sector, what is a financial system that, that supports long term sustainability and affordability in the housing sector look like? Or any, any ideas about what it might look like? Thanks. Uh, so, uh, if we're looking at this in a systemic uh, framework and we're looking at like what the ideal situation would look like, I think. Uh, one of the ways that we can go back to is looking at the idea of land rents. And um, this goes back to the classical political economist, as Laurie uh, very, very helpfully details in his book, which I would highly recommend you all to read, um, but also to Henry George and um, the idea that um, land has its value primarily as place, as and it's generated by what's around it. So. Uh, the same piece of land, the same piece of soil that is in the middle of um, DuPont Circle is worth a huge amount more than a similarly sized, like similarly endowed in terms of like the fertility of the land and the, what grows on it that is out in the middle of Montana, in the middle of nowhere, um, because there's a city around it, there's a US government around it, there are shops, there are people, there are things that help you like there's a the whole state infrastructure um, that makes that land really valuable. And landowners who have often like inherited this land, they've often stolen this land um, from indigenous communities, um, often people living on the land have been brought to it as slaves in like their, their ancestors. Um, and uh, the people who own the land are often in most countries largely the people who have inherited it over time or the descendants of people who inherited land at one point in the past and have sort of like bought different land. Um, so um, really uh, the way that you get rid of this is either um, taxing land rents um, through uh, land value tax, which is the classical sort of political economy proposal, or moving towards 
uh, broad public ownership of all lands um, and then allowing people to build on it um, to pay rents to the state who will then use it for social purposes and helping people to get into affordable housing or otherwise. Um, so systemically, I think that that is the direction that we need to be moving in is to say that the places in our communities, the value generated by our communities around our land should be socially owned and used for public purposes. And that's a long way away. Like that is like dismantling some of the most um, entrenched inequalities and historical injustices in our society. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think that we need to be looking at strategies to try to take as much of that value into social ownership as possible. And then using that to uh, invest in housing and community development um, as we do that. So things like uh, community benefits agreements and things like uh, the sort of British Labour Party proposal that when uh, the area is rezoned for development, that a large amount of the uplift in value will be um, held by the state through, uh, like they will be able to compulsory purchase at the existing use value or something close to it. And then they might be able to sell it on at a higher value uh, to someone else, or they would be able to develop uh, social housing, council housing on top of it. Um, so those are like little steps in that direction. But like, I, I don't see any way of having justice in land and housing while we uh, continue to maintain that historic inherited system. And just to add on the on the on the issue of the finance side um i mean i think it's helpful to think that what i've what i've kind of outlined here and about how the the, the complete link now between the financial sector and property values is, is a very recent phenomenon in historical terms um and it's not happened everywhere so when you ask the question you know what would it look like you know if, if we didn't have this um it's helpful to look at what what was there before and also where what, what what's the case elsewhere um, and one, one interesting example we would talk about Austria, I mean, Germany is another country where house price to income ratios have kind of, and, and most countries have, have gone up quite a lot in recent decades. Germany, they haven't gone down slightly, they've picked up again recently. Um, and if you look at the structure of the German banking system, dramatically yeah. different than we have here. You know, you have at the national level, the KFW, which is the National Investment Bank. At the state level, you have the Landesbank, which is publicly owned state banks. And at the local level, you have Sparkas and uh, which are public savings banks. If you look at the balance sheets of the Sparkassen, for example, far, far higher proportion of their lending is to what you might call real economy, local businesses, etc., rather than property lending. And the way the whole business model is dramatically different, what we have here and in the UK, banks, when they lend, will take collateral. They will, they will basically, it's all automatic now. They don't, people don't make decisions in banks really. There's basically an algorithm. And you take, they take collateral, which is the property. Um, or if you're a business, you will still have to perhaps offer up your home as collateral. Whereas in Germany, it's very much relationship based. So they build up a relationship with the local community, very much trust based human interaction. Uh, and therefore, they don't require this property based uh, system. And, and, much, and, and, and incidentally, you haven't had the rapid house price inflation that, that we have had elsewhere. So I think there's a lot to learn from places which haven't had, haven't gone down this route like we have. And, and historically, so I mean, in the UK, I mean, we used to have a large mutually owned uh, sector which got demutualized uh, in, in recent decades, which operated uh, again on a local level, uh, mutually owned and for the benefit of customers. So I think there's lots to learn. Uh, and this isn't, you know, this is a quite a recent thing that we don't need to, it, you know, isn't, isn't inevitable by any means of it. Build up to my very radical answer. Uh, basically, you know, the question is about how do you finance these? What does that look like? Well, it's like a a catch-22 of a question and, and a, even a, a way to think about it, like how do we finance housing that's, you know, finance itself has so many root issues, right? Um, and so my radical answer, and I, I mean this jokingly and not in some ways, is really to, to basically tax private ownership at a high level, particularly with, where you have evidence of racial and economically inequitable sort of uh, outcomes. So really taxing private ownership at a level that would basically be trying to repair all of the long history of how private ownership even came about. When you mentioned, uh, for instance, you know, to look and see what was there before, 
some might say, well, okay, before single family home ownership really took off in the 1930s in the United States in terms of building out the middle class economy, uh, what was there before that? Well, there was a lot of private ownership, so people were struggling to own their homes. But what was there before that? Well, a lot of slavery and white folks coming to the country and getting land from the government at low costs and inequitable you know, ownership across uh, people of color who couldn't own it. And before that, they were actually full blown and in this country at least without the, the steep amount of you know capitalism going on in the process so how do you get to sort of a situation where you can then value land ownership not in a financial sense but in a more social contract sense and so um thinking about uh perhaps the question getting to the question of how do you build their own land or how do you build property you build you can base it off perhaps some sort of social contracts or social metrics where in the concept of eminent domain folks get market rate or whatever it is when the public takes the land, right? Well, even that itself is perpetuating because have that outcomes that are kind of problematic. Um, could you then create an eminent domain <laughs> strategy that uh, rewards people for getting the benefit of owning land or what have you at the point that they are selling it or putting it back into the public's ownership uh, that is based on social benefit use? That's, that's like the, some people would call that far left and radical would just call that uh, honesty, perhaps. So, thank you. I know whether that's a mic runner or a little pod runner, um, but thank you, Joe. Um, so, this is a little bit more of a granular question from Valerie Piper at the Democracy Collaborative. Um, Wondering, uh, so one of the things that's so compelling about the shared ownership models is that it bakes governance in and responsiveness uh, to the people who are benefiting from the structure into the ultimate disposition of the property and the, the running of the property. Right? And I'm wondering, um, particularly Peter, but really anybody, you know, whether in the larger scale, um, you know, conception around uh, moving back to public ownership of rental property, um, or any of the other kind of rental structures you've really thought through or seen structures that create that same kind of responsiveness baked into the structure of the decision making around the property? So um, I what, what I would say is that I think that we do center some really good models for a sort of nonprofit or community owned housing. Um, it's like community land trusts and other things. But um, there are also obviously examples of nonprofit housing that have uh, really negative records towards like the tenant management that effectively operate as like the wealth generation mechanisms for well paid executives within those organizations. And public housing uh, can absolutely be the same. We've seen that with the recent sort of Trump administration um, efforts to massively increase rents for people in public housing and the disinvestment in that. The Grenfell Tower fire is obviously an example of a social housing tower block that um, tenants in that um, tower said that this place is extremely dangerous and there's definitely going to be a fire here. Um, if you don't put in sprinklers, then we're going to um, <coughs> die. And they did. But what the council funded was instead uh, cladding to make it look better to the rich people nearby. And um, I think that. It is really important when we talk about any form of um, social housing or cooperative housing or anything else like that, that we emphasize how important it is that it be responsible to the communities, that it be demo democratic at the, like, at the base level and that it have the funding structure necessary so that people can Im improve their areas, they can have uh, control over resources to do the improvements and maintenance that they require. Um, the way that I look at that in some of the European systems that have tur turned out a huge amount better is that, um, and this is something that I'm a little bit cautious about talking about in the United States because of the lack of uh, an effective welfare state. What they do is that they use their rents to cover all of these costs. <laughs> and the, um, like as, as units or as projects, uh, the cost of rent covers the cost of upkeep, um, and there can be like community control mechanisms, tenants councils and all this sort of stuff that can then make investments in their communities. Um, 
and then if someone can't afford these cost rents, either there might be cost subsidization, so richer tenants pay a bit more in rent to cover lower rents for poorer tenants. That's what we and Ryan proposed in our paper as a, a potentially better model for the United States because of the lack of an effective welfare system. Other countries will just cover this through um, some limited demand side subsidy for people who um, are below affordability, even with this sort of like cost linked rent structure. Um, but I think it is really important to have a social housing uh, model that has both democratic structures for ensuring that people can control their lives and um, their communities, and also a funding stream that can ensure that they aren't disinvested, that they're not just like talking shops that are able to say, well, we'd love to put fire extinguishers and sprinklers in this building, and we'd love to put like to uh, fix the, like put in a park here but we can't afford it uh, because there's not enough money in our community. And so I think those are the two really key aspects of it. And that needs to be at the core of a social housing strategy. One thing, uh, example that I think is, is, is maybe helpful to share here that kind of touches on, on that point, but also touches on this point about scale. Uh, so how do we move away from uh, the position where these, these ideas are kind of peripheral and small scale to really get really start to make a systemic impact. Um, so you might tell from my accent, so I'm from Scotland uh, originally, and- um, I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's been some interesting developments there uh, in, in recent years um, that started back in 1999 uh, around land reform. Um, and that really started out to do with uh, concentration of land ownership in the Highlands, which is for all kinds of historic reasons, Scotland was owned by a handful of kind of aristocrats really kind of crazy stuff. Um, and, there, and there was a thing called right, community right to buy introduced. And that meant that whenever land came up for sale, the first people who got the right to buy it was the community that lived there. And there was a fund set up by the government called the Scottish Land Fund, which meant that the community could, community could get funds to buy the land. And there's some really great stuff happening in lots of communities where they've taken control of the land, they're now doing community energy, they're all, you know, population is growing again. But for that, for a long time, that remained a kind of rural thing in, in the rural parts of Scotland. And recently now, that's been extended to urban areas. There's now urban community right to buy. And it's been extended as well, so you don't have to wait until it gets put up for sale. If there is land that is uh, derelict or vacant or is deemed to be not being put to good use, uh, the community can actually put an offer in to buy and get money to do it and take it back into community control under appropriate governance structures to make sure that it's about empowering that community. But crucially, it's with support from the state in terms mm. of funding and legislative support to be able to do that. But it's the communities who are in the driving seat. And I think that kind of gets towards that sweet spot where you need the state support because these problems are systemic. But at the same time, you don't want this one size fits all, uh, you know, state, state level solution, which doesn't meet the needs of, of communities. And so I think there's a real power potentially in that model if it can be, I mean, it's just, this is just recent, so it's not yet to see how it plays out. But I think that kind of mechanism could be quite powerful in addressing the scale issue and the, and the kind of governance issue. Could you say a few more words about the um, type of governance structure that's being used? Because I do think that's incredibly important to have it at the level of the property or the neighborhood, um, while the larger structures that, you know, um, there are larger government uh, governance mechanisms in place for state funding, for example, and things like that, that, you know, all this could bubble up to. But a lot of what happens, you know, in the properties like Grenville Towers and a lot of stuff that happens here is really, you know, at the level of the property itself. Yeah, so, I mean, the, basically it comes down to what is defined as a, a community. So when I say community right to buy, there's a definition of what a community is. And it has to be a legal form, so you need to do uh, establish yourself there's about four legal forms that you can be and there's a, a kind of uh, community benefit society uh, there's a there's a charitable one and there's two others I can send you the the, the links of which, which has the kind of here's the four organizations that you can be as a community and there's the different governors ones that you can go down uh, as to which is I'm not sure as to which is the, the optimal or how that's going out but I think it's a really interesting question as to what are the most optimal governance structures in them? But crucially, the, the key thing is- That's required in the government funding. Yes, yes. And also, it is all of them very much ensure that it's the community, the people that live there, who are in the driving seat. So it's not, well, they can receive government funding, but they're in charge, they're in control of, of what you're 
you're actually doing. It's not coming from a kind of a bureaucrat, you know, miles away. Uh, so it's, it's trying to get that sweet spot. Or even local government that may be further. Yeah. Yeah. Just a uh, real quick add, or add on to that was would be to say that democracy is hard and <laughs> um, particularly docs are a little deep. Uh, in the in the paper that uh, that's coming out that I've written and we explored democracy and how it's used and what how the different structures that it's used. The land trust model, that's uh, in conventional sense or sort of more popular model is actually governed in a cheaper to take board governance system. So you've got the residents themselves, you've got the nonprofit organization. And you have community members all, you know, forming that community uh, that help, you know, sort of help steward that land and property that they own uh, in the housing cooperatives. It could be the case of a single cooperative owning one building, or it could be like the square, square model, uh, a collective of associate buildings that are all cooperatives operating in an association um, that also has a land trust. So then it also has the three different branches. So it really, uh, I think it doesn't look the same in most places in the, in the way that it's operating in the United States, I should say. Um, but again, it's also very hard. I live in a cooperative myself, and I know other folks just in talking with practitioners in the space, it's really hard to get everyone on the same page. I, I think a lot of people fantasize and I think idealize these models as something that, you know, oh, community, and they're all in together, and permanent housing, affordability, and long, everyone's got a house. But uh, some people want to sell their homes and make the most money off of it. Some people want to be there forever. So, you know, it's really a balance of needs and interests, and that takes some democratic work. and. No one should really uh, think about it as something that's easy to do. So, uh, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development has been just a wreck. And, but actually, that wreck has been a long time in accumulating in terms of federal housing policy. Um, I sort of wonder if, in a perverse way, that presents an opportunity uh, to. Uh, for some future administration to really say, well, you know what, the old structures are, have been demolished anyway. And in fact, there are now new opportunities to rethink federal housing policy from the ground up and perhaps even create some left-right alliances around the idea of ownership uh, at uh, the community level. Like the actual effect of public policy politics and policy making. So, uh, so yes, for sure, the, you know, for all the, the faults of our current uh, ways and the way that things are going in terms of our public administrations are run, there's always opportunity for sure. Um, and in the United States, at least we've got elections and whatnot that present those opportunities to have big grand diverse ideas and have people galvanize behind those ideas and change the conversation and get really radical or, or really progressive to meeting communities' needs in various different ways. And it's up to the voters to really come down to uh, making decisions on that. On that. Um, in a more tangible answer, I would say that um, I think that when it's a it's a dangerous it could, be, it could go you know good or go bad and so in a lot of ways you know in the past like in the 1960s and 70s we had the government decide that we we're going to go away from uh public housing support and investing in things uh in a in a way you know from public housing because we didn't want that and nowadays we sort of are fearful of investing in social housing in a lot of ways and we haven't really invested it in ways in the past to make it actually work so my answer would be your response to sort of how do we get some of these ideas and strategies to work. But, you know, we've had successful public housing that housed people for years. It just wasn't invested in at the level that it should have been invested in and resourced in a sustainable manner. We could try to do things that we've learned about in the past or tried to do in the past, but do it in a more effective and sustainable way. But in a lot of cases, you throw the idea of public housing out there, people go straight to the worst case situation that they found. And I think that is, um, an issue of the human condition. But uh, on a positive note, I think it's very it's very feasible that at the local level, at least, where some of these models that I shared um, are sort of flourishing, people are sort of galvanizing interests and actually having some success in convincing local policymakers to do it. There is this opportunity for folks to actually try to do these things. And then the federal role, at least, is to try and support it with the appropriate financing and credit mechanisms. Um, I just jump in to say that I think that you're absolutely right that there is potentially an opening for a really, really ambitious uh, set of policy aims at a federal level around um, 
housing policy. I think it's something that is entirely dropped off the political agenda in recent years because of a sense of paralysis in the sense that um, housing and urban development um, like as a policy area is something inherently losing that um, things are just going to keep getting worse. What we, all we can do is like sort of keep ourselves in a holding pattern where things get slowly a little bit less badly than they might otherwise do. Um, and I think that that's absolutely not a, not a foregone conclusion. And it's something that I think a lot of people, if uh, politicians really started talking about housing as something that we can genuinely improve things on and we can really make a huge difference in people's lives, that would be a really winning message. On the topic of left-right alliances on this, I would say maybe on local or municipal levels, there's potential for like some communities to be so hard hit that um, politicians just really feel the need to act. But on a like broad sort of state federal level, I'm very inclined to think that the motivations of a lot of people on the right in America are fundamentally segregationist, white nationalist, anti-poor, and generally just not wanting those sort of people to live in their communities, not really caring about their standard of housing or their standard of living. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. I would love if it did. Um, like I absolutely love if um, the right in America was not racist and um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure if that's going to happen anytime soon. So. Yeah. Uh, do you have any? Uh, want to add anything for us? We're going to wrap up soon. If you want to add anything. Um, I mean, just just one thing, I suppose, to kind of highlight. Um, often, I mean, I'm not sure to what extent it is the case here, but often when you're talking about public policy intervention in housing, um, often on the right, you get this kind of the pushback is all oh, government intervention is you know government interventions are bad kind of neglects the fact that there's what we have today yes. is huge government intervention and, you know underpins the whole thing is mass government intervention property rights themselves yeah. and of course mass government intervention and so sort of flipping around and saying well that what we have today is a product of of you know widespread state, state intervention and the discussion is not whether or not we should intervene the discussion is what kind of intervention or even in the word intervention i think it's just the sort of loaded term you know what kind of public policy and governance and all etc do we want uh, and have a more try and engender a more kind of productive constructive discussion um and moving beyond the kind of uh, the kind of the, the free market fantasy on the right which is government interventions bad um and therefore policy can do anything mm -hmm. well thank you guys for joining us and thank you all for joining us for the conversation and hopefully uh the you know multi-layered fascinating conversation of land and housing really stimulated your brains into thinking about uh, ways to help, you know, get through what we're getting through in many ways. Feel free to send any of us uh, thoughts and whatnot that we can sort of tease out because this is what we live and breathe. Um, if you're interested in more of this conversation, feel free to check out Peter's book, Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. Housing. I'm sorry, <laughs> Laurie's book, uh, Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. Peter Gowan's report on social with Ryan. Uh, housing with Ryan, who's in the room, yeah. and, and then our forthcoming report from CDC, Community Control of Land and Housing and also the NSP blog uh, and podcast that'll be coming out soon. Thank you guys. We do have a lunch coming, or maybe here. Um, and I'll run and check. My lunch. lunch is served in the kitchen. Feel free to eat in there or bring it back in here. We're very lucky. <laughs>